here it comes, here it comes. Ten seconds. Five. Time. Yeah, I mean, since last time we were doing this interview, time has been flying. I felt like last year, it was kind of like a weird ending to the winter because January was so historic. The ADI cow ran. Big waves out of Jaws. Just as I was gaining momentum, February hit and it went flat. Shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. <laughs> It just seems like this long, flat summer finally is over and we're thrust into big wave season. It's 20 feet of 20 seconds on the buoy, which is just absolute toe swell, ADI cow. No one saw it coming. Guys, we're back. Three, two, one, go. All that training that I've done leading up to this winter has paid off because now I can allow myself to do a little more experimenting. The sun's coming up, we're already late. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. Did you think that training is more effective than like, than like what we used to do in the past? I felt like I actually got more out of it, the Nazare training than the other training, because when I ended up going to Jaws and getting pounded like three, four times, <laughs> yeah. uh, it seemed like it was pretty minor. And I'm like, well, it obviously worked. Yeah. And in the past, I didn't feel that good underwater yeah. compared to this. So I was like, I was like shocked that last swell how comfortable you were like you just take like a 60 footer on the head and then you're just like, let's go right back out. Every surfer, every big wave surfer is praying for an El Nino season. The El Nino season and hype is real for sure. Wow. El Nino is like high quality monster surf. Tie on, tie on. Session, I feel like the sport is progressing. Oh my god, look at this thing. Oh my god! Oh. The best wave of the day on that swell was ridden by a 15 year old kid from Maui. I think he set the bar for all the 15 year olds out there to, to follow. 
it's always good to see people pushing their limits and pushing the limits of the sport. Maui is known for pushing the level of water sports in general. That wave that was ridden on a foil was just absolutely mind-blowing. Seeing Matt drop in on that wave, he let go of the rope so deep that we honestly just thought he was a goner. There's a limit to towing big waves on a foil, and he shattered my notion of that. The sky's the limit of what's gonna be pushed, and I know that Kai's always at the forefront of that. For Kai, I don't wanna say it's hard to see, but I think it's just kinda of like, oh, it's not just me out here anymore. There's these other people that are doing really big things. But I think it's actually really good because I think it inspires him to kind of up his game a bit. I don't want to say he's like kind of like the old guy out there now, but kind of, you know. I feel competitive with them in the sense that I love the game. And I love, you know, the battle to be like first or, you know, have supremacy over something, you know? And not because you want to beat them, but it's just the game. And the game is fun. It, it feels like he's already so far ahead of everybody when it comes to towing. It's crazy to see him try to keep pushing further. Ridge and Kai are there every time it's good, and they're always pushing the level of the sport. To be back in the water with my brother on the first big toe swell, his skills as a jet ski operator, as a surfer, as a waterman to pick the waves. I mean, he's probably one of the best toe partners I've ever had. Kai being, you know, such a veteran out there and having like a 12 year jump start on me is like such an advantage for me personally because he teaches me all those secrets that he had to learn the hard way. It fired me up so much to get back into rhythm with my brother, get that first day, get some good waves. I don't think I've ever been more excited for a big wave season than right now. For Kai, he was so fired up to just start the year off strong, start with a brand new trick that he's never done before. That led to me having to make a lot of rescues through the day. All of a sudden, I see everyone pointing or get the radio call, and I have to do like the quickest U-turn of my life. Adrenaline was firing on every cylinder. Good first try. Of course, you never want to fall in big waves. However, I think I have a level of comfort that I can take the necessary risk to maybe achieve something good. Every one of us eventually finds that moment, that limit, where it puts you in check. Kai's down, Kai down. Oh my god. Check for Kai's board, over. Kai's board just went over. It's gonna be far in there.
there's consequences to trying new things out there. Big wave surfing, I think in the past was, it was a lot of like, you know, David versus Goliath. Part of big wave surfing was the survival component and it still is for sure. But I think in recent years, we've seen a transition to like, we know we can survive the biggest waves in the world, but what can we do when it comes to performance on these waves? What is the, the limit? As that performance goes up, the safety gets better. We add more sea dews and you know, the drones are introduced and we have spotters on the cliff. My water safety team, they're our guardian angels. Well, working with a guy like Kai is this, we gotta push ourselves through. At his level, we gotta, you know, step it up a notch on ours, so it makes our jobs pretty interesting. Because when he fails, when he's trying to do that, we gotta pick up the pieces for him. You know, sometimes we'll make it be the ride of our year, or we won't, and then you have people who are completely dedicated to water safety. Nathan down, Nathan down. I wouldn't take the risks I would take without knowing that those guys are there. We have eight, maybe 10 seconds to get that surfer out of there, he's in the rocks. The zones that we have out here is zone one. I don't care how good you are out there, everybody misses. Zone two is in here. We're going in every wave if we gotta. Somebody wipes out and they're under the water for a long time, it's like, oh, two wave hell down. You know, next is unresponsive. Then zone three is anything up on the rocks. Oh no. Hold on, Kai down, hold on, Kai down, speed down. Watch out for this. Surfers get all the recognition, you know, it's the most flashy, but these are the guys that make it all happen. So, you know, guys like Ola, Curtis, Colomona, you know, that are all on our team. Those are really the unsung heroes of the operation. Biggest buoy reading last night was 2619. I didn't sleep after that. Andrea Moeller has pretty much helped save everybody out at JAWS. I don't think I ever planned to be in the safety crew. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's kind of my passion. Like, I'm naturally involved because I just can't let go. Honestly, the JAWS crew, we're always tight. We, de we depend on each other, if not, we're dead. It, it really is one of the, the most wild professions probably in the world. <laughs> if you look back in water safety, you don't, hear a conversation without Archie Kalepa, Brian Kaolana, Double D. These guys are like the pioneers of why water safety is what it is. We didn't look back at anything, we just looked at it as the next frontier. Without water safety, without jet skis, you will die. I started off as a lifeguard and then I ended up being in charge of the whole water safety section uh, for Maui County. Along the way, was uh, very instrumental with getting the jet skis as a part of life-saving. At that high level, you need to know that your guy is gonna come and get you. 
if it wasn't for those guys, I don't think water safety would be the way it is today and you'd see a lot more deaths in the water. No, this is the bomb. Kai, again, it's like that big example, right? Kai has somebody on the cliff with the radio talking to his boat. They know when he's down or when he's on a wave, so eyes are on. Down, Kai is out, Kai, Kai is out. Copy that. The rescue guys are like, learn from that. Good job, guys. One of us falls. Is it just Ola going in after that first wave? Yeah. Well, and then and then you guys are lining up behind like, the next one or? Like on a free surf day, he's your guy, so he's coming in first and I'm coming in behind. You know what I mean? Regardless, like we all go out there, work with different teams, but when we're there, we all gotta be on the same page. I see that there's a unity that's getting stronger and stronger here on Maui every time, you know, every every year. The rescue guys, that environment that they work in is a very dynamic environment. Right or down. It's forever changing, constantly keeps you on your toes, it's very dangerous. Having the training or the consistency to work in that kind of environment, it becomes a natural um, response to providing uh, help in times of need. Paradise on fire. The picturesque town of Lahaina, steeped in history, now faces devastation as flames ravage its beloved front street. At first, we heard, oh, Lahaina, you know, there's a fire over by Lahaina bypass. We thought it was going to get contained, but the winds just, like, were just howling at that point. By that time, all communications had been wiped out. Cell phones weren't working. The cell towers went down. It wasn't until the morning that you we, we heard that the entire town was gone. Oh my gosh, look at the harbor. Unbelievable. What happened the day of the fires, I think, was far beyond what anybody ever thought could happen. It was horrible. I don't care how tough you think you are, you see that kind of stuff, it'll break you. The day after, it was instantly a thought of like, how can we help, what can we do? There's only so much that we could do for the actual burn zone. Really, it was about trying to find where the survivors of this horrific event were and supporting them. You know, we kept the wheels turning because a lot of people could not get supplies, you know, for over a week. That part of the island was so cut off, we couldn't get there by trucks or vehicles. We needed to go by sea. And in some way, that's where we are the most comfortable. A lot of different boats from around the islands gathered supplies, anything from, you know, water, diapers, food supplies, gas. All of the essential needs were brought in via boat. Our surfing community, our big wave riding community, they went into action. One more day back out here with the team, little by little. Their training up until that point became a bigger skill of operation. Our everyday practice and what we train for all year long is water safety and being the most efficient people in the ocean. We're used to assembling really quick to go surf big waves because big waves can you know, happen fast. We'll land somewhere else in the world and have to be operating in six hours. And in this case, with a matter of hours, we were able to assemble and pretty much run our same big wave program, but for a much different reason, a much more important reason than just trying to ride these big waves. To see the skills that we practice in the ocean for surfing be put to use in a disaster situation and how tight that community is, 
It was just incredible to witness. Through all of that dedication and preparation for big wave rescue work, big wave riding, I think they realize there's a greater value in what they do. Right on, you guys. Thanks so much. <laughs> the rescue guy's action was super, super important and a critical role to the ongoing success that is happening and needs to continue to happen right now in this community, the community of Lahaina. This was Ryan Jung's house. Yeah. Going to elementary school, middle school, high school in Lahaina, like that was home. Um, and my mom has had a store in Lahaina. <laughs> Here's our store. It's weird that it's just gone. Yesterday hit the four-month mark since the fires, and this is our first time back to the site of the store. Like, you see pictures and stuff, but it's just driving through it is, it hits a lot harder. We've had so many people in the community that lost their business, lost their home, lost loved ones, so compared to like what most people lost, we are like oh, small scale. It is just stuff and our kids and our grandkids were okay. And you know, that was a blessing because we didn't know for sure till the next day if they were okay. So this, it really put it into perspective, you know, that this is all just, it's replaceable, it's stuff. As hard as it is for us to live through this time of emptiness, because it's all gone, it's also a way for us to think about how do we rebuild Lahaina. Lahaina was always and still is a happy place. So there's the banyan tree, and there is green coming back. The Lahaina fires was a moment in my life that was life-changing. You know, waves will come and they'll go and they'll be here long after I'm gone. But the people and the community, that's right now, that's in the moment. We as a people have been voyaging for thousands of years. We as a people we know how to sail through a storm. We're not sailing for a new destination. We're sailing for a rediscovery. <laughs>